I'm looking at their chat. And they're making fun of me. Scott's ironing the taco box again. Look at that. I'm censored from going on here. <laughs> you can be on the show, but you can't actually be on the chat. I've just fixed that, Scott. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I'm going to do the entire year end issue of AutoExtremist.com and tweets next week. <laughs> No, just kidding. It would never work. That might be painful. Yeah, it would be excruciating. So when Todd shows up, I'll just buzz him in, and I'll uh, tell him to have a seat, and if we can pause for just a second while he gets his mic on. Sure. That'd be great. Should we just both freeze? And it'll be look like a glitch Ooh. in the computer system? That, that would be good. <laughs> We got less DC Auto Geek is getting rid of his Mustang. Hmm. I'm going to re replace it with a CTS V Wagon or Ford Raptor. Here we go, guys. 10, 9, 8, 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone. Your journey, our passion. Chevrolet, the all-new Chevrolet Cruze. Get used to more. And by Hyundai. Experience the 2011 Hyundai Sonata today at HyundaiSonata.com. Hey, everybody. <laughs> Thanks for joining us. We are uh, coming to you live from Farmington Hills, Michigan. I'm sitting in for John McElroy. The lucky dog is in Austin, Texas, driving the <coughs> new Malibu Eco. And with me tonight is Scott Burgess from the Detroit News and Todd Lassa from Motor Trend, who's late, but that's okay. And, uh, you know, Scott's had his tacos, so everything's good. I, I declined because I figured I'd, I'd just have a meltdown. Um, <coughs> but anyway, coming up, uh, don't miss, uh, there's a must-see TV on Sunday, catch a brand new auto line uh, with Mark Fields uh, from Ford, and uh, I'll have more on that on the end of the show, but since Scott, you and I are here, why don't we talk about, well, first of all, let's talk about what you had for your two best vehicles of the year. Well, Detroit News uh, picked for the car and truck of the year, we picked the two vehicles that were not, uh, the exteriors weren't redone, but the powertrains were. And uh, it's the F-150 EcoBoost and the uh, Buick LaCrosse with E-Assist. Now, and I think you're right on this, you said that the uh, F-150 with the EcoBoost basically redefined uh, desirability in pickups, right? I didn't think it was gonna do it. Um, I thought pickup drivers were going to say, no, I want a pickup, I got a big truck, I need a V8. Um, and it never, it happened, as soon as they brought it out, they brought it out in February. By June, Ford was selling more F-150s with V6s than V8s in, they don't even know when the last time that had actually happened. Yeah, and now that, I think they're running almost 60% uh, now. Yeah, and... The, uh, the other beauty of it has been is that the smallest engine is the most expensive engine. 
Yeah, and, that was a brilliant piece of uh, marketing strategy and pricing on Ford's part, because I remember when they announced that, everyone said, oh, what are they doing? And, and I've, I've driven those out in Romeo on the Ford Proving Grounds where they have some really steep hills. And we were pulling 10,000 pound trailers and it just zooms right up. It, I mean, it doesn't have any problem at all. And uh, I have heard, and I haven't, I haven't done testing on this um, in part because I don't have anything that's 10,000 pounds that I can tow. Um, but I have heard that the fuel economy is awful when you're towing. Wow. You're spinning up two turbos. Um, but I, I, I would think it'd be interesting to look at fuel economy towing on the EcoBoost fuel economy towing with the V8, and you may see um, an advantage to the V8. But but for light loads, there's no question that's the way to go. Oh, absolutely. Now, what about the LaCrosse e-assist? I mean, how come you like it so much? This is what we're going to see in everything in five years. Right. Um, we're already hearing uh, about people that next year will start introducing uh, start-stop technology. So that's uh, the e-assist comes with that. It's, that's going to be on everything, right? Start. I mean, it's on the Porsches. It's on the, the new 911 that's coming. And actually, on the 911 drive, it kind of freaked me out because I forgot. Right. You know, I'm driving a stick 911 Carrera, S, beautiful car, and I forgot it had the stop-start, and I was just like, what? You know, did I stall the thing or something? But no. And, and this is a true mild hybrid in all the, what we would know as one, which small electric motor, um, it assists when it needs more torque and to kind of get the vehicle moving at launch, it'll kick in. Uh, GM did a really smart job of mapping out on the throttle uh, every time the engine would need additional power, whether it be in between gears or at different moments, and the car will, the electric motor assist then too. And uh, I mean, it's the irony is that they don't call this a mild hybrid and when they introduced the mild hybrid, it was horrible. Um, I, I think it was the Saturn view. That, yeah, exactly. Uh, and they've come a long way with that. And it doesn't hurt that the LaCrosse itself is an excellent vehicle. Yeah, absolutely. I, the only thing it's missing is a trunk button. That'd be the only thing that I would really want on it that it doesn't have. Doesn't have a trunk button? No, nope, it's on a key fob. You know, that drives me crazy when they do stuff like that. <laughs> well, before Todd gets here, I think we'll, we'll wait for Todd to get here before we talk about the North American Car and Truck of the Year finalists, which were just announced. But since you and I are in the panel, we don't really care that much, but we'll talk about it. Yeah, Todd can plug it. Um, so some news this week. Uh, how about China imposing tariffs on vehicles coming in from the U.S. Uh, over 2.5 liter engine size. I mean, uh, you know, it's the latest shot in a trade war, but I, I'm, I think I'm in a minority of this, but I really do think at some point China's going to, uh, a bell's going to go off and China's going to say, oh, okay, all you joint ventures that we demanded, you're all done. We're taking over. See ya. But other people just say, no, it's just a trade war. What do you think about that? I, I don't know. I, I don't know how much of it's a trade war if you're looking strictly at cars because there are no cars coming yeah. uh, to the U.S. Um, it, I, it affects uh, other companies too. I yeah, BMW and Mercedes and whoever else is sending vehicles. And, and I don't know if that theory that you have is really that far off. Um, that uh, you know, I mean, imagine if the U.S. had a policy where that the, every company that built a factory or wanted to sell cars here had to partner with one of the big three. Yeah. Um, and uh, we certainly don't have that policy. No, but it wouldn't surprise me if, you know, they just said, okay, thanks, we're done, we learned a lot, and now we're going to, you know, you're done here. So now we're going to put 200% tariffs on your cars if you try to sell them here because we're pushing our own industry. I mean, I, I don't... I don't put it past them at all. So, um, what did you think? I mean, Acura is going to have a big show in Detroit, and they had, I mean, they just made a series of boneheaded quotes uh, to the media last week in Las Vegas, which I kind of teed off on this week. But, you know, I think Acura uh, has been lost just like Honda. And now they're, you know, they say they're coming back. Now, they're going to show an NSX, a new NSX, which will have 
you know, probably a mild hybrid or whatever it's going to have. And I'm sure it's going to be great and swoopy and it'll be a, a headline grabber at the show. But in the midst of that, they started talking about how they're actually going to, you know, a lot of uh, a lot of time, effort, money is wasted on the average consumer when it comes to cars. <laughs> and um, I should have kept it, but one one guy said it was a wa <coughs> it was a waste of of energy to over engineer these cars. You know, okay, now we're gonna freeze. <laughs> Sorry, guys. <laughs> Good to see you, Todd. <laughs> Good to see you, Peter. Ladies and gentlemen, Good Todd to Lassa you, from Motor Trend. Traffic, and because I work for a West Coast magazine, they call me at uh, 6 o'clock p.m. Eastern. Those damn jerks. <laughs> Don't say that. They might be watching. <laughs> no, they might be working. Who knows? They're working. They don't watch us unless they have to. Well, they'll watch the, uh, the, the podcast. Anyway. How you been? Good? Busier than usual, than ever. I mean, you know, this auto show coming up, I don't know what it is, but it just seems to be that and crunched deadlines. Now this uh, auto show is going to be full on like it was several years ago. It's going to be wall to wall. And there's already dueling events Sunday night. With yep. Cadillac's going to have the ATS, and, but the Audi's having a thing. And it's just, you know, right. the usual cluster. Well, and it's, you know, uh, you've probably discussed this already. Maybe not. No. It, it's. Uh, a lot of production stuff, at least what we've seen locally, not so much concept. So everybody's getting down to the, you know, kind of the, doing the dirty work and getting out the, the cars that, uh, you know, the, the public who don't know anything about it, uh, about cars won't say, uh, how come we won't, they won't build that car? Why, why don't we see that for four years? Yeah. But, well, before uh, we talk about the North American Car and Truck of the Year, we were just talking about Acura or getting started. You know, they had a thing to the media last week in Las Vegas, and I, I wrote my column on it. They they unleashed a series of unfortunate quotes that, you know, on the one hand, they're going to show an NSX, which will probably be swoopy and cool and be an attention grabber and a visual statement and hybrid and blah, blah, blah. On the other hand, they turned around and said a lot of the technology is overkill for the average driver. You know, it's a waste. Uh, uh, and according to our studies, only 20% are really enthusiasts and really they don't matter. And we're just going to, you know, uh, it wasn't quite engineering to the lowest common denominator, but it was decided, uh, you know, they, they're focusing on two things, economy and it seems like uh, driver friendliness or, or something, but I, I equate it to mediocrity. And uh, I think it's symptomatic of the entire Honda organization. That's Which is really sad. Yeah. And, and I read your column today, and um, <coughs> I, it, it, it's ironic or, or unfortunate, as you put it, that they, they talk about uh, too much high tech, and, and yet they've kind of pinned their, they pinned Acura's premium or, or luxury um, hopes on S-H-A-W-D, which is a very complicated kind of system that adds weight, very un-Honda-like. And complexity. And complexity uh, to uh, overcome the torque steer problem, to overcome the fact that they don't have a rear drive um, platform anymore now that the S-2000's gone. So, uh, yeah, it was pretty, that, that confused me quite a bit. You know, I, Honda, it's, uh, it's unfortunate. I think, you know, most of us who survived the 80s and what was mostly a fairly mediocre decade for cars, um, you know, grew to love what Honda had become. I mean, I'm an old, I was a CRX owner back in the late 80s, early 90s, and anybody who's owned one of those, you know, uh, they, they were the, the up-and-coming company for so long, and where, where have they gone? Well, they were always, you know, the Honda Motor Company, and they were always you know, for the enthusiast drivers, they were the Asian automaker to look at. I mean, they, they did some great cars. And, um, you know, I think as Honda lost their way, I mean, Acura's really lost their way. And if they just do Acura's that are just slightly better Hondas, then I don't think they're going to find a place. I mean, I mean, they've shot themselves in the head repeatedly with their designs over the last four or five years. Well, Acura, the, the new face of Acura, which hopefully is changing quickly, um, the, the Beak, when it came out, um, 
And then they kind of stood by it for two years and then said, well, let's go ahead and tweak it, tweak it and make it tighter and smaller and a little bit better. And, and I think the big weakness has been interiors. I, I, I think that they haven't, they haven't figured out a decent way to do the center stack on anything. Yeah, and, uh, complicated. and I mean, what was it? The Honda Pilot had 50 something buttons and, uh, and, and now the new Pilot that came out, the, it's actually really nice and they've cleaned it up, but you, I mean, it's a lot of the, a lot of times kind of like uh, the way American companies used to do it, where the initial product would be awful, and then it would get better and better. But everybody just remembered the really bad one. Yeah, I guess the just most disturbing thing to me about the pronouncements with Acura is uh, nobody said we're gonna we're gonna make sure they're really fun to drive. Mm -hmm. That was yeah. totally missing. It was like a, a long dissertation about why we're not going to really aim at the enthusiast because after all, you, you know. You're they just not, spend lots of money on our cars. Well, yeah, you're almost <laughs> inconsequential. So why are you going to show a new NSX? I mean, I, I'm looking forward to see it. I'm sure it'll yeah. be cool, but there's going to be a giant disconnect. The old NSX actually, at that time when, when Acura had their lineup, the old NSX was actually the flagship and you could see a little rub off. I'm going to be shocked if we see any rub off in Detroit at the Detroit right. show. Right. And to be fair, the, the TL with Shawd, S H A W D, and the, whatever they call the sport package, I don't remember, drove one several years ago, uh, you know, when they, when they added the manual gearbox back in that car, and it handled pretty nicely. But again, handled pretty nicely for a car that was too heavy because it had to have that all wheel drive and, and uh, too complicated. Yeah. Well, this is a good spot. Ben, we're going to hear from our first sponsor, Chevrolet Cruze. The Chevrolet Cruze is the car that is taking the world by storm. And a key reason is all the equipment that it offers. A driver information center, a USB port, ambient LED backlighting on the dashboard, remote start with a MyLink app, two accessory power outlets, one in front and one in the back for the rear passengers, on start, turn by turn directions free for the first six months. Whew, there's just too much to list here. And you can check it all out at Chevrolet.com slash cruise. Well, we're back. Uh, one thing I wanted to ask you guys is uh, the NTSB came out uh, in the last couple of days and say they want to ban cell phones completely from cars. And I wasn't quite sure. I, I must admit I didn't read the, the details all the way through. but. Is it okay? I, I got the feeling if the system was built into your car, it was okay. They were going to leave those alone, like OnStar-based systems or something that's in your hooked up to your car. I didn't understand what they were saying. They said no talking on cell phones. Well, but remember, the best they can do is a a um, recommendation because yeah. it's a recommendation of the 50 states plus the District of Columbia on on that. And yes, there's been a lot of discussion on. You know what? What about hands-free? Um, they claim the, the, the their studies show that the hands-free is just about as dangerous, nearly as dangerous. Um, there are very various studies arguing that either way. I have to say, I know, I know you're going to say, "Oh, come on, you're a car guy. You you don't want this sort of thing." But I am so tired of you know getting behind the the guy in his SUV in the in the passing lane hitting the brakes every 50 feet because he's speaking on yeah. his mobile phone. And um, I also, Cadillac showed its its Q infotainment system mm -hmm. recently. I th I, you've probably seen it. Yeah, we had a guest on Online After Hours a few weeks ago, the guy, the, the guru of it. One thing I, I found impressive about the, si the system, and, and I'm sure Cadillac's not the only one that will do this or could do this, I'd like to see Ford work on this with its uh, sync and it's my Ford Touch, is that it can recognize, because it's that haptic kind of, as you reach for the, the dashboard, it, it um, turns on zooms and in. It, yeah, and yes. So it can tell whether the hand is coming from the driver's seat or the passenger's seat. So although they're not doing this yet, if they wanted to have a nav system where the driver cannot type in a nav direction, uh, nav address while he's driving, but his passenger can, it can do that. So 
I loved when Chrysler had that button that says, are you not the driver? And you could say, no, I'm not the driver, and then <laughs> type in whatever you wanted. Sure, but this will, would actually be able to tell. And, you know, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. I don't know whether it's that sophisticated or not. But I mean, that's um, that. That's certainly maybe a solution going down the, down the road. You know, I I I don't want to take away freedoms from the driver, but I want drivers to be drivers, not to be people. Well, yeah, speaking I, on the phone. I while hate to see it coming. Driving. Yeah, I hate to see it coming from Washington. I mean, clearly the dumbing down of the driving abilities of the American public have been going on, has been going on for quite a while. Yeah. Well, I, I think a couple of things. That one, um, I like that the discussion is finally coming out that yeah. the, the little thing that you stick in your ear makes you look like a douchebag isn't helping your driving at all. You, you have both hands on the wheel, but you don't, you don't have anything, on, none of your mind is on the road. Yeah. And I think it's good that we have the discussion and people know that when you talk on the phone, you're more dangerous behind the wheel. Yeah. I mean, all of us have been on the road where uh, two years ago or three years ago, I would have said, oh, this guy in front of me is drunk because he's swerving a little bit. They can't keep in their lanes. And now I just assume that he's on the phone. That he's on the phone. Or she's he, on the phone. You'd almost wish, wish that person was drunk instead yeah. of on the phone. You and, be you know, to it's, to I mean, if you're going to talk on the phone, go all the way over on the right hand lane. Be considerate to the other people that are driving. Um, it, you know the, you you know that you're more dangerous, so just try to be a little bit more responsible about it. I mean, we're not going to get rid of phones in cars. People are going to do it, and if you make it illegal, they'll just try to do it in different ways. And better yet, pull over. Yeah. You know, and if you have a passenger, hand the phone to your passenger. I mean, he or she's going to hear the conversation anyway, and and why not have that person? Uh, you know, make the call. I, I don't like talking on the phone when I'm driving, and mm -hmm. almost all of my conversations are typically relatively short, and I can talk to you later. Uh, yeah. Yeah. And uh, I, and I think that that's the good thing that's come out of it. The bad thing is, is look, we're Americans. We do things, and risk is associated with it. Um, if we didn't want anybody to die in car accidents, we could get rid of cars, but we're willing to accept 35,000 to 40,000 people die every year in cars so that I can drive a car, or you can drive a car. Mm -hmm. and. And so the certain freedoms come the fact that some people will die. The alternative to taking away some of those freedoms is that you have uh, companies like Google and General Motors and probably a lot of other companies we're not quite aware of working on autonomous cars so that people can spend all their time Googling <laughs> while yeah, if they riding choose, to work. If they choose to, to hook up to the autonomous lane, yeah, well, they, they can do that. At what point do the autonomous lanes become four out of the five? And and well, yeah, John, and I have, John, I have joked about that. Then the enthusiasts will only come out at night. You know, there's certain times when the enthusiasts can bring their non-guided vehicles out. I mean, you know, yeah, I, I can see that. But I, I thought that one of the most interesting things I read was that talking on your cell phone was the number four reason of distracted driving. In front of that was eating. No one has banned drive throughs well, in, I mean, in front of that was that's um, not American. Now, if playing with your stereo, <laughs> which is more dangerous than talking on your on your uh, yeah. phone. reaching down for that CD or something that dropped. And you know, I'm, and I'm not sure I agree with uh, playing with your stereo is um, more difficult. It is if you're driving a My Ford Touch. <laughs> well, and you know, and the other if you have two radio knobs <laughs> and you reach over and you can hear. The station's changing. If it's easy to do it, and a lot of cars aren't anymore, um, it's well, it's on your steering wheel too. Yeah. I mean, yeah. can you imagine if the NTSB came out and said we, we, we want to ban eating in cars? I mean, Americans just laugh. Well, and remember, th this is a recommendation. They're not. Yeah, I know. Can't do that. It's a state by state thing. Yeah. So as long as that remains the, the, the situation, I think we're going to see a long struggle to get to you know 50 states. Um, I mean, clearly, net-net, uh, net, as we'd all love the quality of the drivers and their driving to be better. Uh, I don't think this addresses that. I think the basic, the way we go about driver's education, if we tried to fix it, it would be so costly. There's, it's never going to happen. Well, of course. And, and that said, I mean, uh, it took, I think, the NTSB, and it certainly took uh, a push to get all states to impose seatbelt laws before drivers other than you, me, the three of us uh, used seatbelts. I mean, the seatbelt use was awful until until that happened. So, 
it's horrible to see that that's what you have to do to get people to drive with some responsibility. Yeah. Say, Todd, since you were on the panel, I understand, for the North American Car and Truck of the Year finalists, maybe we can talk about that. Uh, let's see. That's in conjunction with the Detroit Auto Show, because I hate calling it the North American. I won't. It's the Detroit Auto Show. But they do a Car and Truck of the Year uh, awards in conjunction with that. Uh, the cars this year are the Ford Focus, the Hyundai Elantra, the Volkswagen Passat, and the trucks are the, where BMW X3 isn't a truck to me. It's like a crossover, but whatever. Honda CRV and the Range Rover Evoque. So, what do you guys think of this, Todd? I need to correct you, unfortunately. You're not on the panel? I'm on the panel of the Motor Trend car but you're not on and this. the Motor Trend uh, Sport Utility and Truck of the Year. Okay, well, well, yeah, no, I'm not on that. So point. none of us are on. There, there yeah, are no, there are so no that's Motor good. Trend. So uh, let's back up. So the Motor Trend Truck of the Year was the F-150, correct? Yes, the the, the EcoBoost specifically. Uh, although I, I should correct myself, I was not on that panel, but I did participate in car and sport utility. Of the Too year. many disclaimers, Todd. Too many disclaimers. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, I can. So you were on the car one, right? Car one. And, and what was and that? The, our, we picked the VW Passat, mm -hmm. but only by a hair. There was a, a split vote um, on the first second, first and second ballot between the VW Passat and the Chrysler 300. Mm -hmm. And on the third ballot, uh, the uh, VW Passat edged out the Chrysler 300. Interesting, and the Passat shows up on the North American Car and Truck of the Year. What do you, yeah. guys, what do you guys think of the list? Um, I mean, I think the focus definitely belongs there, and so does the Elantra. And, the significance of the Passat, although I th really think the only Passat I would be interested in is dependent on how you order it. I mean, if it's ordered properly, I think the Passat is significant only because where it's built and Volkswagen's push in this market. Um, I haven't driven it, so, uh, you know. I think it's significant in part because they're doing the opposite of what Ford and Chevy are doing in, with a one-world kind of mid-sized car. You know, whether whether that's a better strategy or not is, is well, we won't know probably for a few years until we see how sales compare. Yeah. But I think that is pretty interesting how they finally did one dedicated to the U.S. Uh, North American industry, and it's larger than the European Passat. Uh, yeah. It's got a lot of nice, a lot of room in it, good fuel mileage uh, with the, um, with the uh, i5, which is not my favorite engine, and with the, uh, the TDI, which in this category might be my uh, favorite, favorite engine. I mean, you know, 43 MPG highway with the, the six speed. I wrote a story a long time ago uh, saying that the VR6 was pretty much unnecessary. And, uh, and I think that's probably true. And I think the- Passat and Evoke win. Huh? Passat and Evoke win. Oh, that, that, that's what we chose. We chose both the Passat and the Evoke for car of the year and sport utility of the year. I, th I think that uh, Elantra and Focus split the vote, both stylized, compacts. Uh, Focus is the the premium version of that. The the Elantra is uh, bigger bang for your buck, yeah. but they're both ba basically 40 mpg compact cars. Um, the Passat, that was a car I was l really looking forward to hating, and I I liked it. It's a nice car, and the diesel with the DSG is yeah. uber fabulous. Yeah, the uh, the styling isn't. Exceptional, and uh, you know we've seen a few previews of stuff that is kind of exceptional in that category. But I think it does everything well. Um, I have a, I, we had a little, we had a problem with the Focus, frankly, and I know you're a big fan of the car. But well, I, they I, they were reluctant to give us a, um, a select shift version, a uh, well, power shift version yeah. of the car. I've driven both versions. With the transmission. I mean, you know, I like I like the car itself. I like the manual gearbox one. Uh, the select shift transmission. Uh... I think when you have problems with your transmission on the year that you're launched, you should not really qualify to be the car of the year. Um, I and think it. You had problems, so they wouldn't give me one. Or? Uh, well, had we problems. had we had driven them. We had driven earlier ones mm -hmm. uh, before uh, our car of the year competition came up because the car launched early in the year, and um, and I I can't remember whether they we even ever got one. We had. 35 entrants for car of the year this year. There were all kinds of cars. And I have to say, 
Um, probably third behind those two cars, and you may disagree, um, we rather liked the Buick Verano. And if you look at a Ford Focus um, Titanium, those, those things are running, that, that's a competitor for the Buick Verano. Uh, you know, loaded up uh, Focus yeah. uh, with all the luxury Price items. Point. Yeah. Well, we'll come back to this. Ben, let's, let's uh, hear from our next sponsor, Bridgestone. Look at this. Bridgestone's using natural rubber, researching ways to enhance its quality and performance, and making their factories more environmentally friendly, producing products that save on fuel and emissions, and some that can be reused again, and promoting eco-friendly and safety driving campaigns. One team, one planet. Bridgestone. Yeah, so that's too bad about, I mean, I like the Focus, I look forward to the ST Focus. Mm -hmm. um, I found with the selective transmission, and I, and I know what consumers are saying and stop and go driving, they're not used to that kind of transmission, and it'll do the jerk thing, but when you hammer it, it's great, you know, it works great, but. Uh, well, but they also, I think they probably held back on, you know, the, the car was, off to a pretty good start in terms of sales, but uh, then they kept talking about how uh, there were supply problems keeping up with demand. I think some of those supply problems might have been holding back the cars and, and, and fixing the transmission. So uh, that was kind of a serious thing. That said, I just drove a, a, an improved one and it is much better. Yeah. Um, fine for me, fine for an enthusiast, especially using the manual control, but I think, you know, it's still, the average buyer might take a little getting used to. Yeah. And what about the truck side? I think the X3 is sensational. I think it drives great. I haven't driven the CRV, and I already anointed the Range Rover Evoque, like the one of the vehicles of the year, like a couple months ago. I just think it's going to be red hot in the market. It's brilliant. Yeah. yeah. Very well done. And if you, if you look at the what what a vehicle does to the brand itself, I think that the Evoque does something more than just fill in a new spot. I think it really kind of moves Land Rover uh, in the, the mind of the public. And, and that really says something, and, and you want something more meaningful. Well, I think it's going to, you know, I think the dealers are going to be shocked. I think people are going to be coming in that didn't really pay any attention to, to Range Rover at all. They see the Evoke on the road because it looks great on the road. And they're going to want to come in and, you know, I think it, it's going to be the biggest seller they have, obviously, using, and, using a Ford engine, by the way. Exactly. And, and, and extra credit for doing a two-door version of it, which they showed as a concept. But you think, well, you know, how many two-door concept crossovers have you seen in the last 10 years? And they actually put that into production. Now, they might only sell 10 of them, but uh, at least they put it out there. Yeah, no, it's, it's a dramatic design statement. It really is. I, I, I think the other thing that the, the finalists in the truck uh, Roundup for the for the Nactoy Award is it's really shown us the evolution of the truck um, and what we call a truck and what is considered a truck. Uh, the the fact that uh, there weren't any body on body on frame. I don't, I don't know the last time we had a body on frame sport utility sport utility yeah. that was in that um, group. That, that that was a finalist. Yeah. I yeah. Don't know. Uh, again, I, I've always only voted on Motor Trend Car of the Year, so I'm not. I don't remember all those, but... But just going back the last five years, you're going, yeah. where was it other than pickups? Yeah, I mean, uh, that was fortunate for us that we split off truck and sport utility back in the 90s, you know, even before I was at Motor Trend, and, and Nakodi and Natodi are still dealing with that. Um, obviously, the, yeah, the sport utilities, uh, 11 years ago when I was on my first uh, Motor Trend uh, sport utility of the year, they were split between body on frame and unibodies. Now they're mostly unibodies. Well, and that, and I want, you know, as cafe rules come and all of these things that are, they're coming into play, I, we're gonna see more of that. I mean, the HHR is a truck. Uh, there's, a, there's a whole bunch of vehicles. Well, that's going away too. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know. It the, hasn't already, I don't recall. I think this is last year. Is it yeah. last year? Yeah. But you look at the things that qualify as trucks and when is it to your advantage, when is it to your disadvantage? And uh, 
things like the PT Cruiser and even the Dodge Magnum in the past, depending on whether it had a flat load floor and... Oh, were those... Uh, I think they, some vehicles were classified one way by the... Let me see if I can get this straight. By the EPA and another way by the... by Not by NHTSA, but uh, depending on which federal agency, mm -hmm. uh, it could go either way. <laughs> So um, what do you guys think are some of the most significant developments in the industry this year? I mean, I had a few, the downward slide of electrification. I mean, just as we're seeing some creative electrification stuff going on, I'm just wondering about it. Is it going to take off or is it going to just hover in this kind of sort of like it stage? Um, the other is I really think we're at the end of the high performance era. This is it. Will there be new definitions? I'm sure, but this is the end of the, probably the ground pounders, unless you're going to spend a lot of money. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, um, you know, we can talk about Chrysler, Ford, GM, Toyota, BMW, Mercedes, whatever we want to do. What do you guys think of the year? Well, one of the biggest stories I think of the year was the tsunami yeah. um, and the, the after effect of that. And, I, the, the thing that I find really interesting is that I really believe that, um, in particular, Toyota was going to have a, a drop off of customers anyway. I think that yeah. um, because of uh, the Americans coming in with such great compact cars, uh, the Fusion and the Cruise, by by the time the tsunami came, the Fruz, Cruise was in full force. The Cruise, that would be Fruz. the combo, combo of the two, wouldn't it? <laughs> yes, it would. And, uh, if Durant had been able to buy Ford, he'd be driving Ford and, uh, But that tsunami really, um, I don't, I mean, it was horrible what happened, um, but the after effects of that is that we've never seen a real big recovery, and I don't know how much of a recovery we're going to see, even though the supplies are now coming in. Well, especially with the position of the yen, I mean, I think we're seeing the sunset on the Japanese car industry. With the currency the way it is, yeah. it's, it's going to be impossible to As really... As a dominant player when you have somebody like Hyundai, Kia. I agree, I think, but I think there's going to be a certain amount of inertia that has made uh, the Corolla, for example, one of the best sellers for, for years and years. Oh, there's a lot of inertia left in the market. So, I mean, the fact that, the, you know, the Corolla in terms of uh, where it was in the, that segment had been slipping already and still sold, you know, 250,000 a year or whatever, and now the Civic kind of in the same uh, category. It, it takes a while to get people out of Hondas and Toyotas and into those other cars, even as they improve and do better. I mean, there was all new Camry this year. Yeah. This is the first we've mentioned it. You know, I mean, it's on nobody's list for anything. No, it's not. And it's, you know, it's, it's not like the Honda Civic where the Civic actually slipped in terms of the design and yeah, the, the quality. Camry's a very confident car. Yeah. Uh, some improvements, but not anything earth-shattering in, in, in an era where you're getting so much more competition finally from the U.S. automakers and certainly from the, the Koreans and now from Volkswagen that, you know, the, sooner or later, even those loyal buyers of Honda Accords, Toyota Camrys, Corollas, and so on, will start to look elsewhere. Yeah, so I figured in the, in the uh, high point of the frenzy about the unintended acceleration, which was, of course, proved to be totally bogus. Mm -hmm. I figured 20% of the Toyota buyers decided they would see what's out there. The rest of them stayed true, but those 20%, you know, could grow. Because there's a lot of great choices, whereas before, you know, you're in the market for a compact, it's uh, Toyota or Honda. Now, it's Toyota, Honda, Hyundai, Chevrolet, Ford, Chrysler's going to have the dart coming in the spring. I mean, it's it's a whole new world. Yeah. Some of that inertia that I spoke of is that, you know, the, the Toyota buyers, the Camry buyers, when they couldn't buy a Camry, went elsewhere, but they went to the, the Nissan Altima, which had some a few yeah. spikes, yeah. Uh, you know. So the, the first matter of business is, well, okay, we look at another Japanese brand, and, and probably a lot of those buyer, buyers went back and forth to begin with between Camry and Accord. Uh, and, and maybe the next step will be, okay, we'll look at Hyundai that's vaguely the same, mm -hmm. or, or, <laughs> or Kia. And, and I think, you know, despite all the strides being made by GM, Ford, and Chrysler, 
that will be kind of the last step. I, it will happen, but it will be the last step. And I think it will probably happen with younger buyers who won't buy what their parents bought. I, I want to say something about the end of oh, I can't say it. I can't say it. <laughs> say something about the end of performance. I, the end of performance. I, I kind of agree. I think it's the end of the V8 as a mainstream engine. But, you know. I'm not I, saying it's the end of performance, but yeah, I think. As we know it. Yeah, the, the traditional. V8s will be harder to come by. I remember thinking it was the end of performance as we know it in the 70s. We're old enough to remember that era. Well, you know, that was pretty close when the Camaro Z28 had 165 Precisely. horsepower. Yeah, I, it was pretty grim. I think, you know, four-cylinder turbos and the like will have a lot to do with that in the future, and I think the V8 will be... A premium. What what the V12 is today. Yeah. I mean, you have, you, right now you need to just start counting brands that don't have V8s, and Buick got rid of the V8 this year. And uh, well, I'm a big I'm a big booster of V8s, and I hope they survive, and I think they will. We'll have to pay a lot, but here's Bentley offering a new Continental <laughs> with a V8 instead of each, the 12, and I think that's going to be a sensational car because I love the 12, but I could imagine the V8 would be at least what 300 pounds lighter, mm -hmm. you know, and still have a bunch of horsepower and. But I just think, yeah, I think, yeah, we'll see turbos, V6s and 4s and uh, V8s will be harder to come by and it'll be very expensive if you want one. But they'll still be there. Yeah, yeah, I agree. What else happened this year that you thought? Well, kind of in connection with, uh, you know, what we've been talking about with Toyota and Honda and the American industry, kind of the emergence of, of the auto industry as the one semi-bright spot in the economy, and that you know these companies did um, reorganize. Whether you like the way it happened with GM and, and Chrysler or not, it happened, and they're still here, mm -hmm. and they are a bright spot, and they can make money in a 13 million car year with 18, 19, 20 percent for GM, um, lower uh, market share for Chrysler and Ford. They can make money, and they can make money on small cars, apparently, or at least they claim they can. So I think that's one of the big stories. Um, Scott, I don't want to. Well, I, I would say uh, the emergence of the Volt, uh, the, in the time and effort they had to do it under severe conditions pre and during bankruptcy, they still. Yeah. I think the Volt is still a technological achievement, and uh, it's unfortunate what's happened. I wrote a column a couple weeks ago saying, you know, the Volt is a technological achievement, yeah. and, and people don't understand that it was pulled off in just dire times for GM. And, it, and it's getting a little bit of the uh, Toyota unintended acceleration treatment right now, and, and actually I was surprised, I was not surprised when GM said, okay, we'll give you a loaner car if you're concerned about your Chevy Volt. But then when hours or days later they said, we'll buy it back from you, um, I, I, didn't, I don't know that they needed to do that. Yeah, I think that was overreaching. I, I actually, uh, GM's handling of it, you know, they did the classic, well, we're going to get out in front of this, you know, classic PR yeah. 101, we have to get out in front of bad news. But I think they overreacted, and I didn't, and it didn't help that Dan Ackerson didn't seem to be on the same page, because right. a, a day of after the media conference with Mark Royce and uh, Mary Barra, uh, he was saying, "Well, I don't know, we might have a problem with the battery." It's just like, you know, he can't be saying stuff like yeah, that. Yeah, yeah, he he does say he does go off script, which is both refreshing and, and scary for uh, someone in Well, you know, it, it was uh, refreshing with Lutz. It's ab refreshing because we're not used to guys going off script. Yeah, in that and it's just, you know, and and I thought he was, he, he learned his lessons after that pretty disastrous interview with the Detroit News. Mm -hmm. uh, but then here he was at the exact time where he needed to not talk. Peter, what it comes down to is uh, cars in a severe accident you, you you drain the gas tank right. when it's stored. You have to drain the battery pack too. Exactly, and it's, it's not you know like I explained in the comment I wrote about it. It's just like yeah, we live in this twenty four seven communication quagmire, and the only thing that people out in social media land took away was Volt's catch fire. 
they didn't. I, I thought that overall that it was it wasn't handled as badly as it could have been handled. I mean, I mean <laughs> which is a compliment. <laughs> Damning with faint praise, are we? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, the but the bigger thing is I think is something that you'd mentioned earlier, which is the 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 electrification of the fleets of the world is not going is going a lot slower than than I think we were given the first impression. I, I don't know how wide the pipe is. Is it, it going to be in 10 years 150,000 vehicles out of the total market segment? Is it going to be 10% of the market segment? Is, I mean, right now it's very minuscule, and, and consumers are only going to learn more in 2012 that el pure electric vehicles are really, really expensive. Well, I think uh, when we have politicians in Washington and Northern California trying to dictate consumer taste, it's not going to go well. I mean, I think elect electric vehicles, there's going to be a place for them. There should be a place for advanced turbo diesels. There should be a place for ICEs that get 40 and 50 miles per gallon. It's going to be this kaleidoscope of transportation solutions. Yeah. But the moment politicians say, oh, no, we are going to have, we're going to be electrified, baby, it just doesn't work. And, and yeah, they're frightfully expensive. And none of them are making money. I mean, no, I mean, there's no money being Well, and, and this is, you know, if you go back uh, a century, I mean, this is the way the auto industry started. You had new technologies, and, and they were only for the very rich until you got production going and ran some holes, and then Henry Ford, uh, you know, building more than one car that was kind of the same way. Yeah. And so, yeah, it, if you look at what other countries do, there, there's always some sort of incentive for some of these, uh, some of these uh, technologies, I, I think there's a place for them. I think there's uh, going to be a s slowly growing uh, interest in cars like the Chevy Volt, um, the, uh, the you know the, the Nissan Leaf because you can go maybe 65 miles between charges is going to be a very limited sort of car. And the new Ford Focus, which they're you know just is coming out, and, and which is going to cost thirty nine thousand yeah. dollars. so it's forty grand for a yeah. Focus. And, and uh, is, is that titanium then? <laughs> I hope so. <laughs> and and meanwhile, uh, to your point, we've got uh, you, you get you get an eight-speed automatic transmission and a Chrysler 300 with a V6. You get 31 mpg highway. You're getting compact cars that regularly get over 40. Mm -hmm. As the LaCrosse is beating subcompacts. I mean, the E Assist. Yeah. The E Assist LaCrosse beats subcompacts. It's a large sedan. Well, we're going to take a break, uh, Ben. Let's. Let's thank our next sponsor, Hyundai Sonata. The sixth generation of the Hyundai Sonata is taking the industry by storm, and no wonder. It offers a fluidic design theme that gives it a strikingly modern, coupe-like exterior design, and yet the interior provides the roominess of a full-size car as measured by the EPA. The Sonata also provides an eco-friendly interior with soy-based foam for the seats. Put it all together with Hyundai's strong reliability and value proposition, and you've got yourself a really compelling package. Check it all out at HyundaiSonata.com. I did a call from the office on the West Coast. Okay, Ben, let's run the rapid fire. Traffic and direction. I, I hear that, and I, I didn't have time for lunch today. All right, Welcome. here we are. Let's see, Mike D. White, which is a greater threat to Ford Focus sales, transmission and my Ford touch concerns, or competition from incentivized fusions and escapes? I would take the latter. Yeah. And on top of that, you know, the compacts, we've had two new compacts this year. The Cruise started early, oh, late Fall, last yeah. year, but um, that helped push compact sales this year. Next year, we're going to have a bunch of new midsize cars, including the new Chevy Malibu. Of a new Fusion, new which is Fusion. really uh, yes. great looking. Yeah, it is. And, and, I, and, and that will take the midsize segment back and up, yeah. put it up. I don't think people are quite prepared for the Fusion, but when they see it, they'll know what we're talking about. Unsprung says, why hasn't someone involved in a cell phone accident? Sue, or caused accidents, sue the cell phone company. They sue bars over drunk driving and gun stores over shooting. I'm sure there's probably someone who has sued. Honda was sued uh, years and years ago for not uh, 
providing airbags in the late 80s model, uh, even though they weren't required by law back then, so. Yeah. This is for you, Ted. Prehistoric says, did the new 300 go too up market uh, over the original 300 in terms of price? I don't think so, I'm, because you still have the Dodge Charger, and I think you need that sort of separation between Chrysler and Dodge. George from Brooklyn says, what does the panel think of the new Dodge Dart? I haven't seen the Dart. I've seen, seen it, but I can't say it. My lips are sealed. Yeah. I'm, yeah, I've got a gag order. <laughs> DC Auto Geek says, will the EPA change their drive cycle test to give the OEMs credit for stop start? They think, need to. They need to. As you know, soon as they do it, every car will have stop, stop start. This is a very confusing thing because there, there will be a couple of cars offering stop start next year. And I, I've asked about that. And in both cases, they've said, oh, it does show up. So I don't know. I haven't had time to look into the changes or what, yeah. what's happened. I like stop start. I mean, you know, I was telling Scott before he got here, I was on the, driving the new 911 Carrera S manual. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, I was just not paying attention. I forgot I had stop start, and it stopped. And I thought I had stalled it. Mm -hmm. It's funny. But it's, it's cool. I really like it. The average driver is going to have to get used to it, but yeah. overall, it'll work. Crayon breaking. Peter, for the Camaro refresher redesign, how can Chevy change the car enough, or are they stuck with the basic current look? Now, if I'm not mistaken, isn't the next Camaro on a different platform? Yes, they've got three more years. It's going to share its platform, because I wrote about this a long time ago, with the Cadillac ATS. So it's going to be smaller. Uh, well, it should be lighter. Okay. Um, that platform will also accommodate the next Cadillac CTS. So that part is unclear. I think it should be smaller. My opinion, it should be more like a 3 Series size. Or yeah, we know, it, we know it'll Genesis. be lighter. But, yeah. um, George from Brooklyn, question for the show. Have you ever considered live streaming episodes on YouTube? Ben, I have no idea. Once we're invited, we will. They have oh. to invite you? Okay. Yep. Glenn e said, is that a Ford or Chevy truck on the wall behind John's seat where I'm sitting? That's a Ford truck over there. Oh, that's, that's a Ford, yeah. F-100. Yeah. Ben, let's go to some phone calls. Is John Dunlap. I live in the Ozarks. I'm a retired old automotive man. I have one thought on all these electric cars. The only one right now that I really would consider would be the Volt, because most of them they kill your freedom. Your ability to pull up and get fuel in 15, five, ten America. minutes, going about your way is over. And until they get that question licked. They got a serious problem. That's my feeling. Thank you. Bye. Well, thanks for coming. My my thought on that: until you can go pull into some uh, re-energizing station and spend no more time than you do filling your tank with an electric car, they're never going to be massly accepted. They're just not. I mean, that's just my because it's human nature. Yeah. I mean. yeah. Okay, Ben. Let's take another phone call. Uh, hi, this is Jeff W. from Albany, New York. I would like the, uh, to hear the panel's thoughts on the recent announcement that the next generation of Viper will not be branded as a Dodge. Is this a good move or a bad move? And is this another ominous sign for the future of the Dodge brand, or should we not read that much into it? Uh, bye. It's going to be called a Chrysler Viper, right? SRT Viper, apparently. And uh, I, yeah, you know, on, on the one hand, uh, it does separate out the, that model and say, okay, we now we no longer have a, a Dodge that's way more expensive than our more expensive Chrysler. On the other hand, they've also separated out Ram from the Dodge truck brand as, as a separate brand from Dodge. Yeah, truck. I'm not convinced that's a good thing. I don't think it's a good thing. They all go in the same dealers. They're going to have more brands than GM had. Yeah. Yeah, they yeah. they have four now. Yeah, so SRT is a brand. So they're, so they're tied with uh, General Motors. Yeah, yeah, in Dodge, the US. Chrysler, and Fiat. I don't think they that, Dodge Chrysler. Oh, they've got Dodge Chrysler, Jeep, Ram, Fiat. They have more than SRT. GM. So they have more than GM. Yeah, yeah, you know, I just think the Ram split from Dodge was really lame. I, I just don't agree with it at all. Ben, let's take another phone call. Hey guys, DC Auto Geek, long time listener, first time caller. I know you may have probably already beat this topic to death, but going back to the NTSB and the cell phone ban, 
when you actually read into the case, the accident that brought that up, the accident of the two buses were both caused because of poor driver error. When one bus driver was tailgating the other bus, and one bus was staring at an RV that was parked on the side of the road. So only one vehicle was actually involved in the whole texting fiasco. So do you think this is just an instance where the administration is pushing something that's not really there to bring more attention to this issue when we really should be educating drivers and not telling them what to use and what not to use and basically telling them to pay attention regardless of what they're doing? Thanks. Well, we kind of covered that. I mean, um the, 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 supposedly the driver, and I only kind of skimmed it, but the driver who started the, the chain of events chain reaction, yeah. was in a Chevy Sierra, I mean a GMC Sierra, where he had received and sent 11 text messages in the 11 minutes prior, or was it in the one minute prior to the uh, accident? I think it was 11 minutes prior to the accident. So, um, and, and he was apparently texting, they were able to pinpoint that uh, when, when the, chain reaction started. Well, look, if, reporting the facts, that's yeah, if everything was uh, wonderful and beautiful in this country and we weren't in a recession and, and people weren't, you know, worrying about jobs, you know, and we had plenty of money, we might be able to upgrade our driver education system, but that isn't going to happen anytime soon. So no. we don't have a driver's education system. Yeah, we no, don't. No, we don't. And, uh, I mean, school, that's the first thing you get rid of right after art. And, uh, yeah, it's all it's all a la carte now. You pay a little agency to do it, and then you got the whole thing about it. a lot of young kids don't aren't really anxious to get their drivers. License. Well, you know, in, I, I know in Germany when I lived there that it was about two thousand dollars in instruction to get your driver's license. You would pay it. You'd wait till you're eighteen, pay the money. It took six months of training, and then you you would have your driver's license, and it was good for life. Um, but if they took it away. You never got it back, and uh, so. Wow. I think that if people uh, invest two thousand dollars to get a driver's license, uh, then uh, they would pay more attention to it. But okay, Ben, you want to do another phone call? Yes. Hey, uh, this is Warren from Paris, California. I'd just like to make a comment on the uh, proposed uh, legislation for the uh, cell phone use. Hopefully, the federal government will be a little more considerate, I guess, is the word for it, uh, instead of uh, taking after California as they rubber stamp they normally do. Here in California, you could be over on the side of the road sitting there, but if the key is in the ignition, you could get written up for uh, using your cell phone, which is totally ridiculous. I mean, they do the same thing if you're washing your car and you have the radio on in the, in the car with the key in the ignition. Uh, they could write you up for an open container or what have you. Yeah, that would seem so to be an, a the, disincentive. The federal government will be a little more uh, realistic well, that would seem to be a disincentive to, you know, you, you, normally you'd want people to pull over to the side of the road and use their mobile phones. Um, but remember, again, this the, the NTSB recommendation is only a recommendation, and and it go and they, they are making the recommendation of 50 states and the NDC, and so it's up to the states, and un unfortunately, you already have what you've got in California. I think anything coming from California should not actually be considered part of the federal government. It should be more of just the California government, California rules, and maybe <laughs> cut off the map. Okay. Well, as long as we can do the same with Texas. I'm, I'm and with Texas, you. I'm fine. Yeah. So Hans Frank says, my question is, can you do a burnout with a stop-start car? Yeah, sure, you just uh, put your foot on the gas and the motor starts and right. hold, hold your foot on the brake and yeah, you can do it. Plus you can usually turn those off. Yeah. Steve says, isn't the solution for electric cars using a wet battery in which you would be able to charge your battery at home or refill it by removing the decharge part and adding new charge part at a station? Something very similar to what's currently done in gas cars. Well, you know, we'll see what happens. But like I say, until you can spend five minutes in a gas station. Does that mean you also clean it with arm and hammer and water or what? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, Ben, is, we have another phone call. Hi, this is Ace in Elkhart Lake, Wisconsin. I was wondering if 
you would say the biggest sin of the American auto industry was big on the outside, small on the inside. Thank you. I wish that was just the uh, U.S. auto industry. Um, yeah, actually, you could probably say that a little bit about the, the Mini Cooper, which is a car I like, but not like the original Mini, where it was big on the outside and small on the inside. Um, some of that might, I, 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 I think that's, I think we're going to see a little bit of a change in that, some of these new mid-sized cars. And by the way, go pack. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Let's see what else we have here. I, I didn't do all of these. Oh, yeah. Um, how about uh, Fisker? Uh, how about Tom Lasorda signing up to be vice chairman of... Uh, and Richard Beatty as, uh, what, marketing chief, I think? Yeah. They've been quiet for a long time, Fisker. You know, uh, um, their their prices have gone up, and you know, they're. I think, I mean, yeah, Lacerdo will probably be a, a breath of reality, but uh, you know. The, the thing, the, the other, other thing they announced is that apparently the price is going to start now above a hundred thousand yeah, yeah. dollars. Which, if they had announced that before we had Car of the Year, uh, we wouldn't have had the Car and Car of the Year, and probably would have done them a lot of favors not to have that Car and Car of the Year. It was it was a science experiment, and I, I think um, you know hiring a lot of executives laid off from other companies won't make any make it any less of a science experiment than the one we drove in September. Well, I, you know, I, I think. Uh the hangover from shelling out big money to Fisker and Tesla, government money, is not going to sit well with people down the road when these companies sort of never amount No one to ever it. mentions them. Yeah. They, they, uh, they got big money from, from the government, but then they, didn't, they don't have enough other kind of capital. They're still operating like the auto business is a millions of dollars industry. It's not. It's a billions of dollars industry, no yeah. matter how small you are. Yeah. That's the problem. Which Assad has found out fatally. <laughs> yes. Well, it, it keeps, it's not quite dead yet. <laughs> no. Well, um, I think we've come to the end of the road here, but um, I'd like to thank all you out there for talking amongst yourselves and not paying attention to what we're saying, just saying. And uh, you can read Scott Burgess' stuff at DetroitNews.com and at Twitter.com slash Autocritic because that's what he does. And Todd can be found at twitter.com slash mt underscore lasa, or of course in Motor Trend at motortrend.com. And you can visit my website at autoextremist.com, of course, uh, twitter.com slash autoextremist, and facebook.com slash autoextremist. And I'd like to thank A.J. Morning, who really maintains our Facebook page. I don't go on it, and he lectures me all the time about the fact that I don't go on it. You have to go on it. Okay. Uh, make sure you check out AutoLine uh, this week with guest Mark Fields, president of Ford of the Americas. And uh, you can watch it at AutoLine.tv starting tomorrow, or check your local listings to see if your public television station carries out of line and more stations are being added every week as we speak so it's a good thing and you can follow auto line uh, john mcelroy's mega empire on twitter at twitter.com slash auto line and don't forget you can also friend the auto line gang on facebook to get all kinds of content throughout the week and you can find the auto line page at facebook.com slash auto line detroit and thanks again, guys, for being with us tonight, being helping me out. And thanks to everyone out there joining us live. We'll see you next week for the final Auto Line After Hours of 2011, where we will present our naughty and nice lists for the year. Thanks again. Auto Line After Hours is brought to you by Bridgestone, your journey, our passion, Chevrolet, the all-new Chevrolet Cruze. Get used to more. And by Hyundai. Experience the 2011 Hyundai Sonata today at HyundaiSonata.com. I'm jealous you guys have driven the Evoque. I haven't yet. I've driven next to it I, on the road. I didn't drive the Evoque. But you, you're getting it tomorrow, right? Tomorrow. Actually, the only, I've only driven it on Sport Utility of the Year. I've only driven it in California, mm. not in the States. 
I mean, <laughs> yeah, not in the States. Not in, uh, I mean, it just looks fabulous on the road. I think when people yeah. see it on the road, they're going to say, it's, you know, it's like we talk about design being the ultimate initial product differentiator going forward, especially uh, electrification, more efficiency. It's still going to be design. And that's a vehicle that people are going to say, wow, what is that? I want one type thing. Mm -hmm. And you worry about, you, you would, I worried about its platform at first, obviously. You know, this is a company that's done nothing but, you know, longitudinal engine, you know, good old fashioned sport utility vehicles. Um, and, uh, you know, this one is a unibody. A boulevardier, as they say. Yeah, a boulevardier, right. Um, but it, it's good. Yeah, and it's got the, um, the turbo, larger Ford turbo four cylinder. Mm -hmm. It's pretty impressive. What do they have? Two turbos under two liters? Is it a one four and a one eight turbos? Or just no, there's a one six. One six. I think you're thinking the one four would be uh, you General about Motors. Ford? Yeah, GM has a one point. Yeah. Four. Four. And Turbo. so does so does uh, Chrysler Fiat. Fiat Chrysler. And then who has a 1.8? One 1.8 one is also General Motors. That's non-turbo. Okay. That's the that's the base engine in the um, cruise. Or, yeah, Sonic. Ford is going to have a 1.6 and a 2.0, and then down the road they've showed that that one liter. That one liter looks really cool. Those engines so far though are only built in Europe. Yeah. That's I mean if, if you're going to make that your volume engine. Type in in the U.S. or volume engine family in the U.S. in cars that are supposed to compete on price. You better start building them here. I think they should hook up with a motorcycle company and put that one liter. <laughs> do a variant of the one liter in a bike. That's a big engine for. I, I mean, that's there's bigger engines on bikes. Yeah, I be. just read about the the 2012 Kawasaki ZX. 12, just the, their ultimate rocket has something like 200 and some horsepower and just, wow. Well, just Ford already has a deal with Harley Davidson on the on the F-150, so they could do a, like a Harley Davidson ad, answer to the Hayabusa. Right? Yeah, a, one, a special one liter. Uh, yeah. Hey, Ben, thanks very much as always. You got it. What do we want to call this episode? We have to do that, right? Tacos. Three guys in a taco. Or <laughs> <laughs> Did we mention the tacos on the show? I couldn't remember. No, I mean the box was sitting we on the desk. We were talking about them on the chat. Yeah, but you won't see that in the podcast. Ugh. I was eating them while on the show. <laughs> what else have we driven lately that you like? Um... I'm on Regal GS uh, right now with the with the six-speed manual and Pirelli winter tires, and it's pretty good. It's a really nice car. It, yeah. Uh, when I wrote the review, I, I'd been driving it for almost the full week, and the whole time I never really got into it, really sphere to drive. Mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, and you're thinking, okay, this is nice, and acceleration is nice, and then um, I was late to go up to something at Warren. Mm -hmm. And from downtown, 